Again, as Chen said, my name is Jackson Mueller. I'm uh, the Director of Policy and Government Relations at Securency. Uh, with me uh, here, you know, Marvin Amarori, uh, Chief Legal Officer, Uniswap Labs. Angan Endigan, uh, sorry, er Erdogan, uh, Head of Ecosystem and Alchemy Network, and then Tom Robinson, Co-Founder and, and Chief Scientist of uh, Elliptic. Um, huge conversation, massive topic. Uh, let me let me start with this. Uh, incredibly challenging question just to really you know set you guys off um, I, I'd like to really start on and, and focus on the term decentralized right um, thankfully the other panels and, and for all the panelists that are in here thank you for not really getting into DeFi today that's you know I was very worried as moderator that I was gonna have to throw all these questions out the window and, and start again but let, let's focus on this term decentralized um, and in particular you know we heard from uh, the SEC chairman Gensler today where he said um, you know, it's, it's rare to have something without some centrality, right? Um, now, I, I don't know if that was the exact quote, so don't quote me on that, but it was uh, in, in, that, in that ballpark. Um, you know, we've heard decentralized thrown around quite a lot uh, these days, so uh, kind of in, in addition to explaining your company and, and what you guys do, um, also kind of uh, give the audience a sense of what do we really mean when we say decentralized and, and decentralized finance? Because um, I think that would really kind of set the the tone, and then we can, we'll move on from there. So anyone want to pick it up first? Sure. So for me, the, the special thing about decentralized systems is that they're open systems. So there's generally no central authority that can restrict access to them. And so that means that it's open for anybody to use that has a smartphone and an internet connection wherever they are in the world, which is incredibly important in terms of... Um, uh, fighting poverty, for example, where access to financial services is a real barrier. But it also means that um, it's open for innovation. So anybody can deploy their own financial service um, on Ethereum, for example, which I think is going to have a huge impact in terms of choice for consumers, um, costs and efficiency. The flip side of that, though, is that open systems are also open to abuse. So we've seen um, money laundering, theft, fraud, happen in DeFi, uh, sometimes because of the fact that you don't need to disclose your identity when using DeFi, um, also because transactions are, are censorship resistant. Um, and that's where we come in. So Elliptic provides tools that helps to manage risk when using DeFi. So regulated financial institutions use our tools to identify risky transactions, risky wallets when using DeFi or crypto assets in general. And I see our role in really helping to break down that barrier between the regulated traditional financial sector and the DeFi ecosystem. Uh, is, this, is this working? I think it is, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so when it comes to decentralized finance, you know, I think of Bitcoin as the first piece of decentralized finance. Like the whole goal was peer-to-peer -peer payments to replace the existing payments infrastructure the peer-to-peer -peer payments protocol and asset. And when you see, when you look at Bitcoin, you know, there are some central nodes. There's a Bitcoin foundation, there's a bunch of uh, application developers, people who upgrade it. But you still have enough different folks who all contribute uh, and who, you know, almost like the gold market or the oil market, there's enough different players that you don't need one central player providing uh, disclosure, for people to understand the asset and how to use it. When I think of decentralized uh, finance, sort of beyond payments, you know, lending, trading, asset management, often done on the Ethereum network, also a network that people think of as uh, quite decentralized and also involving finance. Uh, and for a lot of these uh, protocols, you know, you could imagine that the people who created it simply went away. Right? We don't know where Satoshi is. We don't know where, you know, if, if um, many of these protocols. Uh, you don't need any intermediary. You don't need, if you want to make a trade or borrow assets, you don't need to uh, speak to any, inter any intermediary. You don't need permission. Uh, you simply send a transaction to a smart contract on Ethereum, and those get executed by miners that are competing to execute these transactions. So that tends to be what I think of as decentralization, and uh, I think Bitcoin is actually a great model for that. And the next generations are simply a little more complicated. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm the head of ec ecosystem at Alchemy Network. Uh, so um, decentralization, 
I guess uh, the, the technical description would be to um, uh, distributing ownership and controls upon a network. Um, but the way I like to think about that is that, um, like we all know that term, right? Let the markets decide. Uh, if you think about each of these decentralized platforms as like a market within themselves, uh, I believe decentralization provides a framework for participating in that let the markets decide, right? So through the, the processes of governance, through the processes of participation, both in terms of the financial utility, but uh, also the underlying controls, uh, the, the participants of a network actually have a chance to uh, have a structured way of, uh, uh, to put in what their say is into uh, that market's decisions, basically. Um, so just a little bit about um, uh, uh, like how that applies to us. Uh, Alchemy Network is a um, uh, institution-grade liquidity network, um, and uh, we launched earlier this year with our flagship product um, a, a lending and borrowing pool uh, protocol that has a permission pool in it. Uh, and permission pool requires the, the users to actually come on board uh, going through a bank grade uh, KYC ML process combined with an on-chain allowed listing uh, process. Uh, and once users go through that, uh, we basically allow them to, to uh, lend and borrow on our pool. Now, the, part of the reason why we do that is that uh, we uh, believe that the next wave of growth is gonna come from institutions uh, and for institutional adoption is actually quite key uh, to, um, to understand what their needs are and compliance as it is, is like one of their needs today, right? Uh, so uh, for institutions having a compliant environment where there is no trusted counterparty issues, where they don't uh, deal with illicit actors, is kind of a huge thing. Now, um, I, I think there's like an interesting tension there is that when you bring a, a traditional KYC ML process into uh, DeFi, then you're actually going into that tension of uh, are we centralizing something here or are we staying true to the DeFi's uh, decentralized interoperable ethos? Uh, that's like one of the things that we are exploring further now is that uh, uh, one of the big questions is like, how do we actually make the, the, the process of compliance uh, decentralized as well so that it's not specific to us, but it's also shared across other permissioned uh, platforms? So congratulations to all three of you for addressing that challenging question within like six minutes. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, so we, we've established a bit of a, a baseline here, uh, but we really need to, to talk about, you know, where, uh, where the market is today. And, and Tom, I'd, li I'd like to rip apart your, your recent report. For those who don't know, Elliptic came out with a fantastic report on, on DeFi. I was trying to read it on Amtrak while I was getting jostled around. Um, but uh, it's a fantastic report and it has some uh, pretty tr uh, incredible numbers here. Uh, when, we, when we look at the DeFi market, you've got here total capital locked into DeFi services has grown 1,700% over the past year to $247 billion. That's up from $500 million two years ago. Monthly trading volumes on decentralized exchanges have surged more than 1,500% over the past year to roughly $300 billion each month. Outstanding loans issued through DeFi lending protocols has increased at an annual rate of more than 800% to $23 billion. Now, I think back to what uh, Chairman Gensler said this morning where he goes, you know, new tech outside the policy framework really does, does not persist. And, and meanwhile, I'm reading your report and all these other numbers out there, and it's just, uh, you know, the activity is exponential right now. Um, and, it, and to me, it seems like it, it is persisting. So here's my question to you guys. What the hell is going on? Right, and then why are we seeing what we're seeing right now in these markets, and and what's driving all of this? So th there seems to be a bit of a disconnect between regulators and the industry. In that, from Chairman Gensler's comments earlier today, it, it sounded like he didn't really believe that these systems were decentralized. When and it is a spectrum, right? There is a spectrum of DeFi services out there. Um, some are quite centralized. Some are very decentralized. Um, but in terms of what, why this has taken off, you know, I think you know, it works really well. It's a real alternative to centralized financial services. Um, you know, the benefits in terms of composability, programmability, reduced custody risk, um, mean that for a, a subset of users, it's simply a better solution than existing centralized services. Uh, I, I agree with that entirely. I think it has a use for some people for some users, and that's why they've found it and they're using it. 
you know, if you look, if you look at uh, decentralized lending, you, know, you, you read stories about people who hold a lot of Bitcoin or a lot of ETH and aren't able to use that as collateral with a bank. They're able to do that in DeFi. And so you see those kinds of stories, and that's a need that's being met. When it comes to uh, you know, decentralized trading protocols, you have the benefits of self-custody, instantaneous settlement, 24-7 uh, uh, liquidity in these automated market makers. Uh, and, uh, and, and so some, some people you know, like those benefits and therefore use it. I mean, another reason why is, uh, you know, when you look at the history of the internet, it now feels kind of preordained, but there's a lot of technologies that were invented that at the time, no one thought would take off. Uh, I mean, eBay, people thought were crazy. You wouldn't buy or sell anything from somebody else on the internet. Um, you know, they had to buy PayPal and kind of do a whole bunch of uh, infrastructure to make that possible. Twitter sounded crazy to people. You, you might not remember, but like, you know, telling people what you ate for lunch over 140 characters, people thought that was crazy and that it wasn't gonna go anywhere. Snap, did, you know, sounded crazy too. And when you look at the literature of innovation that has come out of the internet, the idea is that in, innovation is very unpredictable, right? I mean, another, another famous example is when Fred Wilson, one of the best VCs in the world, passed on Airbnb. He thought it was crazy people would stay at each other's homes, and now it's a $100 billion company. Uh, so even the best venture capitalists in the world cannot predict innovation. And the literature of innovation that came out of the internet is you pretty much have to reduce the cost of innovation and let a 1,000 flowers bloom. Let nonprofits try to innovate, let students try to innovate, let big companies try to innovate. Uh, have diversity of the types of innovators and innovative approaches you could have. And you know, for Uniswap Labs, right, we, when I say we, I kind of mean our CEO Hayden, uh, you know, invented uh, you know, V1 and V2 of the protocol with, with a few other folks, but you know, mainly it was him. He was, an un he was a laid off electrical or mechanical engineer. He wanted to learn how to code. He got interested in Ethereum. Uh, he went very deep in Ethereum. He was like sleeping on couches as I understand it. He had a $100,000 grant to do a security audit. And then he launched this thing uh, a few years ago at the time, there were a whole bunch of other decentralized trading protocols with, that raised hundreds of millions, tens of millions, that had dozens of employees and engineers, and this thing took off. And so when you look at you know, what the hell is going on, it's a thousand flowers have bloomed, and a few of them uh, have, to, have taken off. And, and, I, and I think that's really the story here. Um, so. I guess we can consider the growth in DeFi in consideration with the growth of crypto at large, right? Uh, and there, I believe that there are so many reasons of that. Um, globally, if you look at it, like, you know, there are a lot of countries where people don't have uh, absolute faith in their national currencies, in their uh, uh, economies or financial models. And I think um, it used to be that, you know, like growing countries uh, have this and developed countries don't have this. I don't think that's the case anymore. I think uh, over the course of the last five to 10 years, we kind of have seen that uh, there's a shift in even developing countries that people want to diversify value across uh, uh, like national currencies as well as uh, digital currencies. So that's like a very individual mindset, I think that uh, with crypto that's accelerated. And uh, the interesting thing is that the program, program, program app programmability, the <laughs> usability, or the, the utility, the proliferation of utility around digital assets actually is like so high uh, with uh, crypto that uh, as soon as you start holding uh, uh, that digital asset, then the utility around that is like within arm's reach and it's just a matter of like getting into it. Uh, so uh, for that reason, I believe that there is like a rapid acceleration of proliferation mutually, both in terms of using the, uh, the, the currency, but also like the offerings of utility around uh, the, the assets themselves. Um, what we also see is that the, um, uh, interestingly enough, specifically for DeFi, we see like a crazy demand uh, from institutions, uh, a, a different use class. Uh, so, uh, and that is, uh, I think a reflection of like the, the growth in uh, retail market, as well as um, uh, what we realize is that capital allocators actually are aware that there's a lot of pressure on them from their own LPs that they want to get into the into this new asset class where they have to build new practices. 
so there's like some urgency uh, and interest in uh, getting into it. I mean, I'm saying all of these in addition to obviously, yes, there's the unbundling of the complexity of financial systems, uh, and ye yes, there's like a lot of interesting utilities around digital assets themselves. So I, I gotta I, I gotta focus now. You know, we, we talked about the kind of good side of DeFi, but of, of course I gotta talk about the the risks and the potential downsides uh, fr from DeFi. And when I you know read those read those numbers, seventeen hundred percent, you know, fifteen hundred percent, you know, I'm, I'm based right outside of Washington D.C. and I can tell you that lawmakers will read the same thing and go, oh my God. Like, what is this? What are we getting ourselves into? And then, of course, the, the various horror stories that we've seen so far in, in the DeFi space. On top of the very good stories, there's also an equal amount, if not more, bad stories. So um, let, let's focus on the risks here. Tom, I'm, I'm going to go back to your, your report. Um, and uh, again, you know, uh, you put together kind of a compendium of, of risks that you're seeing in this space. And I think, you know, from the audience perspective, it'd be interesting to kind of see what you guys are seeing in this space from a, from a risk standpoint and, and where things are really, if there's a, a concentration of risk in a particular area that you're seeing, uh, I think we'd be interested in kind of hearing yeah. that. So I think it's important we, we monitor and quantify and track these risks um, so that we can come up with ways to manage it and to reduce it. And that's what we do as a business. So one of the core principles in DeFi is that custody risk is to an extent eliminated because instead of financial service users having to entrust their ass assets to a third party. Assets are instead stored in, in smart contracts, and those funds can only be moved as per the, the rules enshrined in those smart contracts. The problem, though, is that those smart contracts, those dApps, are created by human beings, and human beings make mistakes. And so we've seen over the past couple of years that mistakes in, in DeFi services have led to about $2 billion in losses for DeFi users. Um, and so uh, one, one caveat to that, though, is that of that $2 billion, about $700 million has actually been returned by the, the people who stole it. And, and that's probably because of the transparency of DeFi. You know, people exploited these bugs, stole the funds, and then realized, what am I going to do with it? I, I'm being tracked on the blockchain. I, I can't get away with this, and so returned a lot of it. Um, what we're also seeing is proliferation of smart contract audits, bug bounty problems, and I think over time, as well as the, the technology maturing, um, we'll see those losses start to go down. The other risk we've been monitoring is use of DeFi for money laundering. So we have seen, for example, uh, thefts from centralized exchanges, and the thieves will um, take the tokens they've, they've stolen and quickly send them through DEXs to convert them to Ether, for example. And the reason they do that is because um, if they're holding a, a centralized stablecoin, then there's a risk that they might have their assets seized by the issue of that stablecoin. However, if they can quickly turn it into Ether, which is censorship resistant, then um, nobody can take that away from them. We're also seeing decentralized cross-chain bridges being used by criminals who actually, their, their criminal activity was in Bitcoin. So ransomware operators, uh, darknet market operators, they'll take the Bitcoin they've, they've earned and they use a cross-chain bridge to send it into, for example, Ethereum and then use DeFi services um, on those funds. Um, and so, of course, that's a big risk for traditional financial institutions that are looking to engage with DeFi. But, again, the transparency of the blockchain does provide a, a partial solution there. They can use blockchain analytics tools to ensure that the particular DeFi dApps or the particular wallets they're dealing with, um, the funds there don't originate from criminal activity. And so, yeah, transparency, I think, is a, a solution there. So for, for Marvin and Engen in, uh, in, in particular, um, you know, with all of the risks that, that Tom was talking about, we're still seeing massive uptake in the, in the, in the DeFi space. So it doesn't seem to be phasing you know, too many people out of, of participating in these markets. And obviously, you're, you're well aware of you know, the, the challenges as it comes to how do we protect consumers in, the, in these markets? Um, how do we ensure that uh, you know, the, the funds are protected? And, and that sort of thing. Um, so I, I guess you know when you when you talk about uh, you know consumer adoption in the space, institutional adoption in the space. How do you reassure these folks that 
yes, you should be you know t partaking these in these uh, in these markets, and yes, you know to some extent you are you are going to be safe. Well, so some of the uh, protocols have a track record and a history of being secure, right? And obviously, you know, he mentioned security audits from some of the top security audit firms in the space. And at some point, um, the, the fact that there are funds locked in these contracts, that, that itself is a honeypot, right? If you see a lot of money that's been in certain contracts for a long time, um, you, you might wonder why, haven't, why hasn't it been hacked and often it's because it might be secure or possibly a vulnerability hasn't been found yet, but I think people gravitate towards uh, those uh, protocols that are the most secure. I do think that over time, uh, and I'm really excited to see more and more analytic uh, providers like Elliptic, TRM Labs, Solidus, focusing on DeFi. Right? And I think uh, the transparency of DeFi uh, does actually lead to these interesting situations where people might do a hack and then the next day are like, let me give it all back and be a white hat as a result. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really encouraged by, by uh, all the new developments in technology uh, around DeFi to help protect folks. And when it comes to a lot of these protocols, they're, they're as permissionless as Ethereum. So there is no company that can turn off the Ethereum transactions. There is no company or person that can turn off uh, some of these uh, transactions on decentralized protocols. There are some, some interfaces, some on-ramps, there's some ability to track them after the fact that I think does discourage folks both before and afterwards. Uh, so uh, the primary risk that um, in addition to smart contract or financial risks or um, like other, you know, like the obvious stuff, like the thing that we deal with, uh, with institutional participants being our focus is the the tr trusted counterparty risk, right? So in uh, in DeFi, since you're in Wild West uh, most of the time, uh, you, you're not aware of who you're dealing with and at an individual level, most of the time, this could be okay for uh, smaller amounts transacted. But when we are talking about institutions, that actually becomes kind of a big deal. Um, and per uh, the, the due diligence requirements of uh, the, the regulations that the institutions are currently subject to, um, what we do is that we, uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, work with like a constellation of partners for compliance, for regulation technology, for uh, law firms to actually mitigate uh, the compliance risk for institutions uh, so that they know that they're dealing with um, uh, people who went through a similar diligence that fits into their compliance frameworks. Um, so that is like one thing that uh, is uh, um, uh, that we do actively. The other thing is that we see uh, the institutions getting into space again uh, is that um, there's not enough uh, resource for technical development in the space. Uh, and what we do, uh, what we see is that all institutions coming into space actually have to establish a new practice in their firms to actually run the, the DeFi operations or crypto operations. Uh, and for that, they actually have to hire folks, right? So what they, they end up doing is that they set up their new departments, their new heads, and uh, there are a lot of people who are actually struggling with like uh, sourcing their teams with the right type of talent. Uh, that run uh, the, the operations, and since we are talking about large amounts, small mistakes or uh, lack of experience can actually uh, translate into uh, massive risk there. Uh, so those are like the, the two things that uh, I can think of. There's like one other thing that I'll uh, quickly mention is that maybe this is less of a risk, but more of uh, related to risk is an opportunity cost is uh, staying passive for uh, waiting for regulations to come. Uh, either result in uh, uh, crazy risk taking or overcorrection. So balancing these two and finding the right balance of like, how do you actually um, maybe like get in a proactive state uh, instead of waiting for regulators to come with like uh, a technological solution that matches your protocol solution? How do you actually get into a proactive state and uh, start picking up the slack and um, essentially offering your own solutions for the same intent the regulators are trying to come on to you. I think that's like the other thing that I would, um, maybe part risk, part opportunity cost. Uh, sh so, uh, 
living in DC, focusing on uh, you know lawmaker scrutiny of, of several emerging technologies and, and, and bank uh, regulators in particular, uh, have focused on cloud uh, technology in particular and, and concentration risk and that sort of thing. And so when I when I look into this space and DeFi activity and the fact that 70% of this activity is taking place on Ethereum uh, alone, uh, is should I be concerned? Should regulators be concerned about the concentration of this activity on on the Ethereum network, or is you know the, the fact that you know the the uh, a number of DeFi apps and they're using other networks is that a you know is that a good thing? Um, should, should we I guess should we con be concerned about this concentration risk uh, on the Ethereum network? I mean, I I don't believe so. Ethereum is not an island. I mean, the beauty of this new financial system is that it's interconnected. And as Tom was mentioning, there are bridges built into um, 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 you know, comparable uh, emergent chains, um, which all come with their own moats. And it's a relatively democratic environment in terms of the offering of the technology itself. Uh, and with the emergent bridges, the liquidity is actually able to flow freely across chains now. So I don't think that there's a concentration risk uh, necessarily. Uh, I, I agree. Uh, you know, if you a story that's often told uh, is in the early days of Twitter, they had this open API and anyone could build all these different applications to access Twitter and send tweets. And at some point, Twitter decided, hey, we're going to take all that activity in house, and they turned off the API and all these businesses that had been funded and built on it. Uh, you know, kind of went away. And uh, Chris Dixon at Andreessen Horowitz refers to blockchains as software that can make commitments. Right? Ethereum has kind of made a commitment that it won't turn off, uh, in software, that it won't turn off the API after it reaches 70 or 80 percent concentration, right? At no point can any person kind of take that away. And so uh, some of the risks of, let's call it monopolization, which is being a monopoly and engaging in exclusionary behavior, is something that simply can't happen, uh, I don't think, on Ethereum the way it's designed, and it's designed to be that way. And you, you would see ads occasionally that Blockstack would take out uh, right, right outside of Google, right? Google had a, had a motto, don't be evil, and they would write that and say, don't be evil, and would cross it out and say, can't be evil. The idea is built in the software, hopefully, that no matter how successful it becomes, uh, you, you can't really engage in that kind of exclusionary conduct. Let's uh, let's turn to uh, a little bit on this this acronym called uh, NFTs um, in particular. It's, it's part of the title, so I figure we gotta we gotta dive into it. Um, I've you know obviously we've heard of the sixty million sixty nine million dollar JPEG. We're hearing about people's interest in in pictures of bored apes. Um, you know what the hell is going on here, right? I mean, are, are, are there similar benefits and, and risks that, that are at play here? And, and what are we seeing, uh, you know, is, is, there, is there more to this uh, that, that needs to be considered? So in terms of the risks, I think the NFTs are probably even more traceable than uh, fungible crypto assets. You know, they're distinct things uh, that can't be split up or, or, or laundered as easily. Um, we do see quite a lot of funds coming from, for example, Tornado Cash and being used to purchase high value NFTs. So it's an open question whether perhaps illicit funds flows are, are going into this market. It could equally be just people trying to uh, maintain their privacy. So I think um, it's still an open question. We haven't seen much evidence of illicit use of NFTs. Um, <coughs> I I'm not very well informed about the NFT market, so I can't say for sure, but based on my understanding. You, you haven't bought a board ape or anything like that? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> I have some pixels. Yeah. So, um, I mean, every new emergence of power and generational wealth uh, results in some explosion in the art market, right? Um, so I think it's not surprising that wealth native to crypto actually creates its own art market almost and nft being the enabler of that as a as a technology that makes total sense um, i think it, it's also interesting to see that it's not only um, just at making use of uh, wealth but also enabling um, artists that are otherwise maybe not empowered 
as much. So it's empowering that, that art world uh, in very rapid, short cycles. I think that's part of the interesting part of it now is that like every artist uh, and a lot of designers I know are working on creating new things that may actually uh, be of value to, uh, to asset holders. Yeah, the, the, way, um, the way you ask that question and the way a lot of us think about NFTs, like, wow, this, this is weird, right? Reminded me of uh, Crypto Dad's story about, you know, respecting the next generation and what they're interested in. But I remember when, I don't know, in four, third or fourth grade, you learned mm -hmm. that some Van Gogh painting sold for millions of dollars. And you were like, but I, could, I, I have paint right here and I have paper right here. Why would someone pay millions of dollars for something that could, you know, t cost about $20 to make? Uh, and it's the art market is this peculiar thing where you buy these things you like and it kind of shows people that you're wealthy and you have this affinity. And I think with everything becoming digital and the next generation just being completely digitally native, the way you essentially communicate what art used to communicate is digitally and the way to do that is through NFTs. So I, I think that's what's going on. We'll see if it, if it sticks, but I, but I imagine it will. So should I convince my kids to draw some artwork and NFT it in, in the hopes that I don't have to work anymore? Is that, you know, should I? <laughs> you, you know, my earlier answer about letting a thousand flowers bloom, <laughs> I would say you should go ahead and try it. Um, all right, let's, let's touch on a, on a much larger topic. And uh, it's one that uh, I think a lot of folks in the DeFi community and, and just general uh, community are interested in, and, and that's the kind of regulation and regulatory approach to, to DeFi. Um, and in particular, you know, I think um, I really want to focus on this this word perimeter. Um, we heard it. We heard it today. I've heard it in the past in various testimonies on on uh, on the Hill and also through statements. We heard from Chairman Gensler today about ensuring that this is you know within the public policy framework. Um, I, I got to be honest with you. You know, given given the level of growth and where the DeFi market is right now, and the fact that this market is still persisting despite being outside of the regulatory framework, uh, are are we already too late in bringing this market within the public policy framework, w whatever that looks like? Right. I think that's a, a, a trillion dollar question. Um, and and. and in addition to that, you know, do we need to reimagine what this perimeter uh, should look like, um, and and how do we do it in a way that really maximizes the benefits of DeFi, but also ensures that we're adhering to the mission statements and the visions of the various agencies, whether it be in the U.S. or, or around the world? So it's a loaded question. So good luck. Yeah. So I guess I've I've focused a bit on the uh, the misuse of DeFi and some of the losses that DeFi users have been, have suffered. Um, I think it's probably quite easy to latch onto that and obsess over that and not think about the benefits of DeFi. I think DeFi is going to be a huge wealth creator and that needs to be balanced against the relatively low level of risk that's currently present in the DeFi market. Um, I think that what might risk that wealth creation is over-regulation or misappropriate regulation. For example, trying to fit the same old rules to a system that is fundamentally different. Um, I think also there are op clear opportunities to do regulation in a different way, leveraging the nature of blockchains and DeFi. Can we make some of the compliance processes that are currently done by businesses part of the smart contract functionality, of, uh, for instance? Um, so yes, I am a huge believer in DeFi. I would hate to see inappropriate regulation threaten um, its potential. So let, me, let me just ask, uh, on top of that, you know, we heard from the chairman today talk about you know, similar activity, you know, similar regulation. Is that just not a possibility for you know, these new you know, markets? I, I mean, anyone, yeah, anyone. But, um, but I, I'm coming back to you, and then we can go beyond that. Similar activity, but uh, very different infrastructure very different um, roles played by participants. I think we should think of decentralized application like machines that people use to achieve certain outcomes. Um, and maybe it should be different participants um, that bear the regulatory burden. I think, it, like, I wouldn't get too hung up on uh, 
what, what was it called? Similar activity, similar regulation. I think we should think about it more like similar intent, what's the method? Um, so, um, like I, I have a problem with this idea of a perimeter. Perimeter being a circle and there's a center of it, meaning that there's a panopticon like looking at you. Um, the, the way I like to think about it is that if the intent, um, like if we agree on the intent to say protect consumers or if we agree on the intent to set a, a bar of a standard, uh, then I think uh, we should actually quickly switch, to, switch gears to a, a dialogue for like what is the method then to actually reach that intent with the current tooling that we have, right? Because uh, the current, you know, AML procedures, I think go back to like, if I'm not mistaken, 80 years or something. So um, like w given like what we have today, like how do we actually accomplish the same intent without centralizing into like one eye looking at everyone because that's what perimeter is. So how do we actually have a lot of like alignment across the board uh, for the intent of, okay, we will, you know, set up standards, we will follow these standards and for these intents. I think that's a very different type of dialogue than, you know, like a top-down uh, uh, inter, uh, inter intervention style regulation. Marvin, last words? Oh, I, I, I was going to repeat what Brian Brooks said earlier. I thought his, his framing was quite helpful where he talked about regulating based on the types of risks and analyzing the risks that we're actually trying to address. Uh, and I think that that's constru constructive as well. Well, thank you guys. I know we've run up on, on time and I'm getting the thumbs up from, from folks in the front here. So uh, please give a round of applause. They spoke about DeFi for 40 minutes, so congrats. <clears throat>